going to talk today about uh, some some soil health things. And you know, here's a picture. Of my my son, uh, my youngest son's there on the left. He's an adult now, but uh, this is me, and I'm there with the whistle, uh, coaching. And you know, it's the urban environment's important uh, part of what we do, and agriculture is important part of what we do. And the question is, is how does uh, soil health uh, affect all this? And I'm going to call this bugs in a jug. You'll see why in just a minute. But uh, it, let's just have a little fun. As you focus on these dots, what do you see? Um, well, they kind of move around, right? And if, as you try to focus on a dark dot, they just, they just kind of move. Uh, moving target, uh, that's a, a bit of a problem, some, some parallels to what we're talking about today. Uh, this is even a better parallel. Is, are the horizontal lines parallel or are, do they slope? Um, you know, it might, uh, it might seem like they slope, but if we actually measured them, uh, we would see that our eyes are deceiving us. And that happens a lot. We get a lot of deception that happens in the world. Sometimes we deceive ourselves or deceived by others, sometimes on purpose, sometimes intentionally. It's important that we are careful though in, in what we do. When we talk about soil health, uh, this is a definition from the NRCS. Um, soil health, also referred to as soil quality, is defined as the continued capacity of soil to function as a vital living ecosystem that sustains plants, animals, and humans. This definition speaks to the importance of managing soils so they are sustainable for future generations. To do this, we need to remember that soil contains living organisms that when provided the basic necessities of life, food, shelter, water, performs functions required to produce food and fiber. Continuing on, uh, only living things can have health. So viewing soil as a living ecosystem reflects a fundamental shift in the way we care for our nation's soils. This is kind of a new, a new thing, I guess, is what they're trying to say there. Soil isn't an inert growing medium, but rather is teeming with billions of bacteria, fungi, and other microbes that are the foundation of an elegant symbiotic ecosystem. Soil is an ecosystem that can be managed to provide nutrients for plant growth, absorb and hold rainwater for use during drier periods, filter and buffer potential pollutants from leaving our fields, serve as a firm foundation for agricultural activities and provide habitat for soil microbes to flourish and diversify to keep the ecosystem running smoothly. Now, obviously NRCS is kind of focused on agriculture, but that's true whether they're talking the urban environment or, or uh, wildland systems or, or whatever. So uh, lots of effort been going into the soil health thing, especially recently and, and sort of NRCS is sort of championing it and, and some good intentions, but also some difficult things that I don't always agree with. I feel like there a lot that's being done and said or are not based on science like they should. And so we need to be a little cautious as we move forward. And this is new, nothing new in terms of effort though. We've seen a lot of the soil health things, but, but I, would, I would argue that we have to measure in order to avoid being deceived. So uh, you look at this as I love this. Uh, you know, here's the U of U guys, uh, President Monson and his counselors, uh, President Hinckley and President Faust, um, uh, all U of U graduates. And then we got the BOU guys. Now, now if this was our only perception of these two fine institutions, uh, we might draw some an inaccurate conclusions. Um, so, you know, how do we avoid that, that deception? We have to measure accurately in order to avoid deception. So that, that's important. It's important to understand. It's important to understand the scientific method in order to measure accurately. Uh, I, I like to talk about this bug in a jug thing. Um, I, I always am getting these things coming across my desk. So-and-so has got some miracle product that's got a bug in a jug and it's gonna revolutionize agriculture and the urban environment and blah, 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 blah. And it's, it's really uh, just, just a constant battle that, that is always these miracle claims, uh, snake oils, uh, often we call these. Let's talk about that. What, what really is happening though in this living system. Uh, the microbial groups include microflora, such as viruses, bacteria, algae, most of the fungi are included as microflora. There's some others as well. Microfauna, uh, protozoa would be an example of that. Uh, so these are living things in the soil. Uh, these guys are very tiny. We can't see individuals unless they're grouped together. Uh, they are everywhere, ubiquitous in the environment. We find them all over the place. Germaphobes would like to do without them, but if so, debris would cover the earth because one of the best things microbes do for us is decompose things. Plants and animals can't survive. Uh, we have microbes in our guts. 
plants have microbes associated with them. Uh, it, uh, some of this is good, uh, you know, is it good or bad? We'll talk about that. Um, in terms of numbers, these are outstandingly high numbers. I mean, look at these numbers per ounce of soil, millions and billions and trillions even. Uh, and when we start adding that up to how many pounds per acre in a, in a six inch slice of soil, we're talking a lot, a lot of, of tons per acre. More microbes in a teaspoon of soil than people on the earth, trillions compared to like 8 billion people on the earth. That, that is a, an amazing thing to think about is that they're everywhere in there. Um, they're so small we can't see them, but just sort of gives some kind of a concept of what we're talking about. Um, a lot, you know, it adds up to a lot. Now, when we start looking at the soil in the rhizosphere, which is the soil right next to the roots, we get an increase in orders of magnitude increase in, in these um, in populations of microbes. And why? Well, because they're feeding off of the root exudates. Sometimes they're infecting the plant. Sometimes those infections are good. Sometimes they're bad. So is it good or bad? Well, you know, in general, the microbial involvement is a good thing overall. Definitely some pathogenic, some other negatives that we'll talk about. So in terms of detriments of soil microbes, again, they can be pathogenic. They can produce harmful chemicals. Uh, we also have problems with immobilization of, of nitrogen. Um, for example, if I put on a bunch of sawdust out in my garden, um, that has a really high carbon to nitrogen ratio. And uh, the microbes are gonna try to decompose that sawdust and they might suck all the nitrogen out of the system and my plants that are trying, I'm trying to grow in my garden might be nitrogen deficient because the microbes are gonna feed first. There's so many of them everywhere they're gonna kind of suck all the nitrogen out of the system. So that's really important. And, and we run into that all the time. So we need to be a little cautious of putting, you know, high, high fibrous materials into soils, um, especially if you're mixing them into the soil, you know, things like bark and, and certain types of leaves. Um, you know, if, if they're composted and kind of decomposed, that's, that's, that's better. Or if we're just having them sit on top, it's probably not a, too bad as a mulch, but, but we need to be cautious of that particular one, especially. Uh, we can get into nutrient loss. So microbes are responsible for denitrification uh, would be the biggest one we're concerned about. And that's a very, uh, creates a very potent greenhouse gas. Um, so we, when we're managing fertilizers, we need to take that into account. Now, when we talk about pathogens, we, what well, we always talk about this disease triangle, we have to have a susceptible host. We have to have uh, over on the left, the pathogen, and we have to have a favorable environment. Uh, if we have all three, uh, we have disease. Now, if, if I have uh, me as a human, I have certain pathogens that might infect me and um, I'm a susceptible host for certain things. Um, and if the environment's favorable, then I could be in trouble. Uh, some things that are pathogenic for humans are not pathogenic for plants and vice versa. So again, it has to be a susceptible host. And, and oftentimes these things are very specific in terms of what hosts they'll go after. All right, what about benefits of microbes? Mo mostly these things are beneficial. They're good for us. Um, uh, they can promote plant growth. They can help soil, uh, and make soil and stabilize soils. They're a really important part of soil development. Uh, they can degrade xenobiotics such as pesticides, uh, nitrogen fixation from legumes, uh, and also just out in, the, out in nature, uh, we get uh, certain microbes that will take the 78% of the nitrogen gas that we're all breathing right now and convert it into a usable form of nitrogen for plants. Uh, also other aspects of nutrient cycling and nutrient uptake in plants, water uptake, like these last two, uh, like mycorrhiza fungi uh, can infect plants and help with water nutrient uptake, for example, would be a really uh, good microbe out there that we like and oftentimes we inoculate. Uh, also biocontrols, they can help control pathogens. Uh, uh, we'll talk about that more as we go here. The question is, is are we destroying soil health? This, this accusation gets leveled at humanity increasingly. Um, it's, uh, it's really uh, commonly bantied about and, and there are lots of inaccurate statements that are, that are said. I, I read recently in a, in a book, this guy was supposed this expert talking about how when we put on fertilizers, it just destroys the soil. It kills all of everything in the soil, the worms and the microbes and everything. That's just not true. That's malarkey. Um, pesticides, same thing. Um, I'll talk more about that here in a second. So it's, it's a myth that anthropogenical practices destroy microbes. Uh, do we affect them? Yes. But, but these practices, they affect things 
but it's, it's not completely true that we're destroying the soil health. Do we do things to affect soil health? Yes. Sometimes are those negative? Yes. Uh, these practices do influence microbial numbers, species, and ratios. Let's look at this as an example. It's a great little example. We're looking at three different agricultural fields. Uh, here are some populations of a particular uh, uh, pathogen before fumigation. Now fumigants are very typically very nasty pesticides. Uh, they tend to be some of the most uh, difficult pesticides we have in terms of toxicities to humans. Um, they, they are very dangerous. So um, we, we handle them with caution, but sometimes we just find ourselves needing to fumigate a soil in order to knock a pest population down. Um, what, one of the things we see, first of all, is that there are differences out there. Despite the fact we've got these three fields in close proximity to each other, we have different populations. And that's the reason for that is, is why, you know, it could be that last year we had a susceptible host in field three and we didn't in field one. I mean, there could be a number of environmental factors that affect why you would have these uh, different populations. All right, now, after we fumigate, did we kill all of the microbes? No, we didn't. We don't ever do that. Did we knock their populations down? Yes, and that's one of our goals, is just to suppress those populations. If we look at the critical level, you know, where the point at which it's like the soil can handle, we can handle some infection without being too negative for a crop, for example. Um, it's when we start getting these massive populations that really start wiping things out. So in field one, we successfully knocked that population down. I'm probably not gonna have much of, a, of an issue with this particular pathogen. Field two, we didn't, you know, we kind of knocked it to the critical level, but uh, we didn't knock it below it. And so there's probably some damage. Field three, frankly, we, we still got a major problem despite our fumigation. So this is kind of the reality of the world of, of what we might uh, see. Now, what about a year later? Did we destroy these things? No, they're gonna rebound. If you have a susceptible host and I have the pathogen and I got the right environment, the disease is gonna grow. They're gonna have babies. Uh, they're gonna, their population is gonna grow. So this is the reality and what it's being bantied about, about destroying all the microbes in the soil. That's just, again, just untrue. So uh, th this myth, uh, here's another fact to think about. We have what we, I like to call the scope effect. The scope effect is, of course, scope is a mouthwash. And it, right on the label, it says it kills 99.999 something percent of germs, right? So it doesn't kill them all, it gives most of them way better than those fumigants, but, uh, but there's still some, some left inside your mouth after you rinse. And so what happens? Uh, well, they start having babies. They're a susceptible host and uh, you got the pathogen and you got the right environment, nice warm, moist uh, conditions, lots of food in there and those, they're gonna grow. And so pretty soon you got bad breath again because the microbes are taken off in your mouth. So that's the scope effect uh, is what we just basically showed in the previous uh, graph. Let's talk about another thing that's kind of interesting. That's really, really a, an important concept for the world. Um, so, so nitrogen fertilizer, um, we have, the, have massive amounts of nitrogen fertilizer. It is the main nutrient that is deficient. Uh, more than half of the fertilizer sold worldwide is nitrogen because it's just such a huge, huge problem. And in order to make nitrogen fertilizer, most of it is made from the nitrogen gas that we they take out of the atmosphere. So that's free, but it takes a lot of fossil fuels in order to uh, develop the energy in order to use in the Haber-Bosch process to, to convert that nitrogen into a usable form as fertilizer. So back in 1974, there was an oil shortage and there was a lot of, of interest in creating a solution for this. Um, and, and so we understand this whole concept about, I mentioned about the microbes that will fix nitrogen out of the air. So like, hey, let, let's develop some microbes that we can just go out there and put them on and let them do this naturally. Um, if we, can we just juice up the system of what's already there and, and just be able to you know, grow a corn crop or whatever? Um, now there's some of that already happening out there in that corn crop, but it's not enough. It's not enough to grow crops. If, if we just depended on uh, that natural cycle without addition of fertilizer, we would have massive starvation throughout the world. Um, our urban landscapes would be nitrogen deficient. Our agriculture would be worse. Um, so 
So it just doesn't work. So, so the, you know, the research though is like, well, what can we do? Can we develop some microbes to, to do a better job of this? Well, guess what? They found some, they worked really great in the lab. They did what they were supposed to do. They fixed nitrogen out of the air. So super excited about that. Um, this dean at, uh, at one of the universities where this work was being done even went so far as to say in 10 years, it will be unnecessary to use nitrogen fertilizer on grass crops. That was in 1975. Uh, that did not come to pass. Why? Well, it didn't work because we can't control the rhizosphere very well. Uh, they, these bacteria that, that were, you know, did great in the lab, when they got put out in the real world, they just died. And what uh, my good friend uh, Steve Elbrecht uh, calls the French poodle effect. Um, Steve says uh, that, you know, French poodle does okay if it's in your house and everything's controlled and you don't have any predators, but you put the French poodle out in the jungle and it's probably not gonna even make it past one night. Um, it's, just, it's just a weakling. And so a lot of these bacteria that get developed in a lab, they're, they're really kind of weaklings and they're not gonna survive in the real world. Now, that doesn't mean we should give up. In fact, I'm hopeful that someday that we find this solution and that we can, we can do this. We need to continue to do that research. And boy, you want to talk about a great, uh, a great uh, effort. It's this. But bottom line is, today, we don't have this. So what can we do? We, we can't go out there and, and do that. But what, what are things that we can do to manage soil health and soil microbes and biology? Well, we can do these things. Uh, let's talk about them. Inoculation can work, uh, even though those microbes I just mentioned didn't work. There are others that do. Um, for example, the rhizobium that uh, we, we have with the legume. Rhizobium is a microbe that infects legumes uh, like alfalfa and clover, peanuts, etc., and thousands of legumes out there. Um, if, if I'm trying to grow these things, we can actually inoculate them. Rhizobium is not a French poodle. It's a tiger. It's, it's tough. It'll survive out there in the soil. And so that one works. Um, uh, mycorrhiza is another one. Um, it'll survive out there. Uh, so that's those are two examples of things that we actually can inoculate. So when, when I get you know, presented with bug in a jug, um, my question is, is, number one, will it survive? Do we have evidence that, that whatever bug you're selling me is going to survive? Sometimes they don't even survive in the jug. We get the jug and everything in it is dead because it's it was stored on a shelf and it's it, whatever. Anyway, pH or, or salts or whatever killed all the microbes in the jug. I can't tell you how many times I've gotten bug in a jug and everything's dead in the jug. Kind of ridiculous. But, but, uh, but even if it is survived in the jug, is it going to survive in the soil? And the second question is, is, is the species already there? A lot of times I'm being sold these species that are already out there ubiquitously in the environment. Why, you know, and, and, and they're out there in greater populations than what's in my little tiny jug. So sometimes this bug in a jug stuff is just kind of, you know, foo-foo juice is what I like to call it. Um, uh, you know, doesn't, it's not really gonna make a difference, but, but is there potential? Yeah, mycorrhiza, rhizobium, two examples of, of ones that we can do. So, and will we develop others? Lots of research going into this right now, and there are a lot of possibilities out there. So we're excited about uh, some of these possibilities. Now, let's switch gears. What about population and ratios? Uh, we, we can affect populations and ratios of, of fact, bacteria to fungi, for example. We, as we do this, we need to kind of remember the things that, that microbes need to survive. They're similar to a lot of other organisms. Uh, they need food, uh, uh, temperature, nutrients, water, oxygen, pH, and some of them need light. Um, in terms of the things that we do, you know, in, in the urban environment, agricultural environment, typically there's plenty of nutrients in water out there, oxygen, pH. Uh, the two things that we can really mostly do is affect the temperature. Tillage, for example, will affect the temperature. Um, uh, it actually raises the temperature. Um, I can put things on the soil potentially to darken it up to uh, increase the temperature. Usually though, a lot of the things we're doing are actually lowering the temperature. Putting on mulch lowers the temperature. Um, growing plants actually lowers the temperature. So those, and lowering the temperature actually reduces microbial populations. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but I'm just, I'm just saying that some of the practices that we do does affect temperature and affects microbial populations that we need to kind of think about. Um, the food part of this is even more important. Now I put carb in there, but you know, really, you know, it's it's you know, carbon-containing materials like like you know, 
plant residues and, and composted manure and things like that. Now within these, uh, the, the molecules are connected with energy. You know, we take photosynthesis energy from the sun and that gets stored in these molecules. Well, the microbes need that energy. And as they decompose the materials, they'll use that energy. Plus they will use the nutrients that are in the, there, including the carbon, but also nitrogen and sulfur and zinc, et cetera. And so they'll, uh, they'll use those things. So if we uh, add things like organic matter to our soils, that could potentially improve it. So, so on a grass, if I recycle my clippings instead of hauling them off to the landfill, uh, that's a best management practice to, to recycle those clippings. And I'm, I'm putting some food back out on the soil, improving the soil health. Um, is it huge? No, it's not huge, but it certainly helps a little bit. Um, I, can, I can incorporate uh, organic matter into my garden, for example. I can kind of mulch things. Now, plants are actually pretty good at infusing organic matter into the soil themselves. Um, even if I don't put my, my grass clippings back, grass is actually really great at, at infusing organic matter into the soil. So plants are, are really good at, at doing that overall, but we can, we can have an impact as well. Um, now, a good friend of mine, Dr. Jeff Miller, who's a pathologist, he said, in general, the best thing we can do is to stimulate a diverse, substantial microbial population. This results in natural suppression because there are more mouths at the table. So it, that's, that's one of the best things we can do in terms of controlling pathogens is, is instead of trying to kill all the microbes, is actually having more microbes is, is a good thing. So, so, you know, if we can do things to kind of stimulate microbial growth, that's great, you know, but adding bug in a jug, it's not really what he's talking about. He's, he's kind of talking about just developing healthy soils, following good management practices, uh, including the, the things we haven't talked about today, the chemical and the physical side of things, making sure the soil is not compacted and um, it has good aeration in it, um, has good pH and nutrient concentrations, all those things, all those best management practices for plants also apply to the soils. It's, I kind of consider plants as sort of the canary in the coal mine kind of a thing. Um, back in the days when they did this and it would be mining uh, in a coal mine, for example, uh, they would actually have a canary in a cage. If the canary died, and I know that sounds terrible, but if the canary died, it was a signal to the miners that the air was going bad and they needed to get out of there. Um, plants are kind of like that. If plants are growing and healthy, guess what? Microbes are growing and healthy. Um, I, so I just really reject the idea that, that humans are destroying, destroying the soils. In general, that's not true. When we go out and measure, actually measure, there are large microbial populations in these soils. Now, sometimes, especially with monoculture, we are, are getting pathogen concentrations that are pretty high. Um, if I grow potatoes in the same ground year after year after year, I'm going to build my pathogens up. That's not a good management practice to, to do that. So monoculture is, is you know, a, a, a bit of a problem. In the urban environment, the biggest problem we potentially have is grasses, you know, because that's kind of a monoculture, kind of like that. Um, you know, so, but, but uh, you know, most of the rest of the urban environment, we kind of get a variety of plants and and in gardens, we kind of try to rotate where the crops are being grown. And so those are good principles as well in terms of creating this diverse microbial population that Dr. Miller, Miller talks about. All right, um, research that is both honest and correctly designed is important in order to avoid being deceived. Um, all these principles I've talked about are true. There's all kinds of things that are being researched right now. You know, maybe in 10 years, we'll talk about some new things that are good management practices. But right now, I think it's important to stay true to the basics um, and to try to just do good management practices and our soils will be healthy. Um, I, I would invite us all to uh, stay in school, uh, continue to learn and make sure we uh, don't make dumb mistakes because we're, we uh, aren't, aren't being careful enough and we don't have the right kind of knowledge. Doing this is the best way to avoid being deceived by bugging a jug. Thank you. <laughs>